Section 8.3, estimating mu, which means we'll be finding confidence intervals for the mean. We're in mean land now. So we'll find, we'll estimate mu. We won't know sigma, so sigma, the standard deviation, is unknown. And then we're going to use this thing called the t distribution. So how does what we learned in the past couple sections change if instead of estimating the proportion, we're now going to estimate the population mean? So before we can do anything with, anything with means, we need to have a large sample or we need the population to be normal. Do you remember what a large enough sample was? N was greater than or equal to 30 in mean land. So I'm going to alter the formula for proportions a little bit to make it apply to means. So our confidence interval for proportions was p hat plus or minus the z-score times the square root of p hat q hat over n. How did we come up with that? That was the mean plus or minus the z-score times the standard deviation. So to mean land, we're going to find the mean of x bar and the standard deviation of x bar to convert to mean land. So the concept is really similar here, but the formula will be really different. So let's see what happens to the formula. We learned that the mean of the x bars back in chapter 7 was mu plus or minus the z-score, and sigma was sigma over root n. Unfortunately, these are population values, and we're estimating the population. with a sample. So we need to make a few changes. So we don't know mu or sigma, because we have a sample. So I have a few questions before we derive the new formula. So what should we do if we do not miraculously know the value of sigma, right? Why would I know the true value of sigma, right? This population standard deviation. We don't know the population. So it should make sense that we probably want to substitute the sample standard deviation, which was S. It just doesn't quite immediately replace it. Um, you might or might not remember, but sigma and S weren't quite the exact value. Um, so what happens is we may or may not remember samples have slightly less variation than the population just because it's less data. Um, it's just an estimate. It's just not as accurate. They tend to just have a little bit less variation. So if we substitute S in place of sigma, what effect will this have on our confidence? Uh, our confidence would be smaller or more narrow. So it's going to make the interval a little bit too much smaller. So what we're going to do is we need to regain that lost confidence. Why is it getting smaller? Because the variation is just a little bit smaller. So we're going to need to do this trick to make our interval a little bit wider. So this is just to convince you why I'm making these changes, and then you can just jump into the change. So we're going to introduce this new curve. Instead of using a z-curve, we're going to use this new curve called a t-curve. So when we're in mean land, we're going to use this new curve. Otherwise, the process should feel very, very similar. So this T curve um, is a little bit wider. And so that's how it makes up for that. So if X bar is normally distributed, then we can use this new thing called the studentized version of X bar. And it's called the T curve. Notice the formula looks the same as a z-score. It's the x bar minus mu over the standard deviation. Uh, the new thing with the t-distribution is it has degrees of freedom of n minus 1, sample size minus 1. So degrees of freedom, um, if we think about like three people picking a candy, right? The first person can pick any out of three candies. Let's just draw them. Here's candy 
We'll make them like M&Ms or something. Three M&Ms. Just to understand what degrees of freedom is. So the first person gets to pick any candy, right? They can pick yellow, green, or red. So they pick the red one or pink one. Now the second person can pick, still has a choice, right? The second person picks yellow. Now the third person has no choice. The third person has to take green. So that's why degrees of freedom, the third person has no freedom here. So the sample size minus one is where degrees of freedom comes from. And it has to do with the idea that that last person doesn't really have a choice. Um, and so this new thing called a T-curve, it, um, it looks just like the normal curve um, and it varies depending on degrees of freedom. So the shortest one would be degrees of freedom one. It's the shortest and the widest. That would be degrees of freedom one. And then as we ask, add more degrees of freedom, it gets a little more narrow. So the next one, I think I put degrees of freedom five. And then eventually it makes the Z curve, which is the most narrow version and tallest version. So it looks like a Z curve. Alone, you would think it's a Z curve, but when I combine them, they're a little bit wider. So just like Z curves, the total area is one for 100%. Just like Z curves, it's symmetric about zero. And just like Z curves, it extends indefinitely in both directions and flattens out. So the first three are just like Z curves. What changes is degrees of freedom. So the smaller the degrees of freedom, the wider and shorter the curve is. So we have to go out a little bit farther on the T-curve than we would on the Z-curve. And that's making up for the error um, by using S. Makes up for sampling error by using S. What else? And then as degrees of freedom gets larger, then it starts to look more and more like the standard normal curve. Essentially, larger sample sizes will have less sampling error, so it'll be more like the Z curve. And so T sub alpha, this little fish thing, is the T value with area alpha to its right. And we probably saw that on the table last time and I just didn't talk about it yet. So maybe you saw T like 0.05 on that table. We'll get into that in a second. So confidence intervals for the mean, we're gonna use T instead of Z. So for the mean, we'll now use X bar. For plus or minus Z, instead of using Z, we're gonna use a T score. And then for our sigma over root N, we're gonna use S over root N so that we can use sample values. So this is my formula for finding um, a confidence interval for means. So we can just jump into this formula now. I just wanted to convince you a little bit of why we're not using z-scores anymore. But otherwise it's the same, it's the mean plus or minus a t-score instead of a z-score times a standard deviation. And so we're some percent confidence, we'll just say k percent, that the true mean is within this. So x minus t times s over n, and then x plus t times s over root n. So exact same idea as proportions, just a totally different formula. So let's practice the t-score and then we'll do confidence intervals in the next video. So I'm gonna use the table um, I think it's way more efficient than calculators, and not all the calculators have the function. Um, so that's also why I like to use the table. So I'm going to copy and paste the table over here just so we can use it. So T of 05, that means my tails are 05. That's when I would use this one. And degrees of freedom 12, which means my sample size was 13 because that would come from 13 minus 1. So it's really easy from the table really fast. So we go over to the 05 column, you go down to 12, and it looks like it's 1.782.
Um, there is an inverse t function on some calculators. If you want to find it, go for it. I promise you this is faster. So our t score would be 1.782. All right, should we do B? So we want to do 0 0.05 and degrees of freedom is 4. So again, that means my sample size was 5 because degrees of freedom would be 5 minus 1. So we're going to go to that 05 column again, and we're just going to go down to 4. And I get 2.132. So this is just how we'll find the t-score for the formula. All right, just a couple more. Um, T of 0 0.025, so the tails are now 025 rather than 05. So these will be my tails when I'm doing confidence intervals. And N is 23, so that means we need degrees of freedom, would be 23 minus 1 or 22. So we'll go to the 025 column, which is the third one, and we'll go down to 22. And I get 2.074. All right, next one. We have T of 0 0.025, so we're gonna use that 025 column again. And N is 95, so that means, again, we need degrees of freedom. It'll be 94 for 95 minus one. It's always the sample size minus one. And then we're gonna go down, and you might notice there is no 94. So the rule is, is you're going to use the closest one without going over. So 100 would be considered going over, so we have to use 75. So in the 025 column, we get 1.992. We'd rather slightly overestimate than underestimate in terms of this number. So we'll use 75. The rule is use closest without going over. And so T is 1.992. All right, we'll do one more and then I'll just fill in the notes which talk about using the closest. And then Z. Notice this says Z and not T. So sample size doesn't matter, right? The Z curve was the same no matter what. And so Z scores, we could use inverse norm of 025 or we could just use that last column to go a little bit faster. So 025, go down to the bottom. I find that way faster than inverse norm. So my z-score is 1.960. So two quick notes, and then I'll see you back for the next video. So if degrees of freedom you're looking for is not on the table, then you'll always use the lower one in between, the degrees of freedom you're looking for. Um, so don't go over, basically. It's a little outdated, but if anyone's seen the price is right, right, you can't go over. Whoever gets the closest without going over. And then you can find some z-scores at the bottom of the table. It's in that separated row below. And so it's nice because all the common z-scores are there, so they can be faster to find. So in the next video, we'll put this all together to find confidence intervals.